make a few quick announcements before we get into preaching God's word. First and foremost, I want to welcome you out this morning, beloved, to the Victory Chapel. Place of Jesus Christ is wonderfully changing lives, beloved men. We do kind of a great joy to have you with us, whether on English or Spanish live stream. Once again, we do apologize. We had to begin a little bit late, amen, uh, having a little technical difficulties. But thank God, amen, we have guys that men that know what they're doing. They're fixing the place up, amen. Thank God we're back on, amen. So that's a great blessing, amen. If you've been watching us on live stream, it's a real joy to have you, whether on English or Spanish live stream, amen. It's a great blessing, amen. I do want to encourage folks, we have an evening service tonight, beloved, beginning at 6 o'clock is our prayer, 7 o'clock is our worship time, totally different sermon, beloved, and Monday through Friday, we're afforded a wonderful opportunity, beloved, we have a place of prayer, you can come and lay hold of God in prayer, beloved, amen, many of us like to start off our day with some coffee, some bagels, donuts, whatever you will, but I want to encourage you, start your day up with some prayer, amen. And you'll see God help you, beloved. That's Monday through Friday, beginning at 5.15. And I tell you this, beloved, I, I've been here for a bit of time in, in, this, in this area, 22 years now. And I, I marvel at how many folks, you know, they'll tell me, you know, you know, you guys actually have prayer in the building. You, you know, can I tell you something, beloved? Uh, the Bible talks about God's house ought to be a house of prayer. Amen. It ought to be a place of come, you lay hold of God. And, you know, I encourage you. Maybe you might say, you know, I can't make it every single day. But, you know, if you take one day a week, begin one day a week. Sisters, I say this with grace. Maybe you're not working and, you know, you, you, you can get around a little bit. You know, carpool, work together. Put some chip in, help out of gas. But come in prayer. You'll get so much out of it and just the camaraderie of being together. Amen. That's how you build, build a close sisterhood in the Lord. Amen. And I tell you, that's a great blessing, amen. You'll see what God will do. Also, Wednesday nights, beloved, 6.30 prayer, 7.30 is our service. We are asking God for help. And also, the 27th, beloved, we do have a wonderful time. We have my pastor is going to be in the area, yeah, Pastor Dave Suspansky from Jacksonville, North Carolina. He is my dad in the faith, beloved. I tell you what, 
I love him dearly. His ministry, his, him and his wife have been a blessing to my family. And I tell you, even to this day, beloved, I, he's pastoring my, my, my daughter and my son-in-law and my grandchildren, amen, and, and the mother church. And they've been a great blessing in our lives. His leadership has served us well. He's going to be in the area. It's going to be the 27th. There's a men's discipleship in Upper Darby. I want to encourage you, every man, come on out. It's going to be a great, great time, the Lord. And it refreshes his heart to see the baby work, amen, uh, the work, you know, the, the, the daughter church launched out, beloved, to see what God has done in the Bronx. That's going to be a great time. And on Saturday night, and we don't do this very often, but at 6 o'clock Saturday night, we're going to have a time of prayer, 6.30 going out, which we're kind of cutting short a little bit just to go out, pass out some flyers. It is so well worth it. You know, yesterday, uh, busy schedule. Folks were outreaching and have a concert. And in the midst of this, beloved, we did have a time. I know I had uh, uh, was one, two, three, four different apartments uh, yesterday, but we did get a manage to get some time and go on outreach. And I tell you what, got to see a young man. And I tell you, what a great blessing. Got to pray with this young man, beloved man. And I tell you what, what a miracle of miracles that a church can actually go out and actually be Christian in an ungodly society. And that we have the audacity that we're not just going to hide in a building, just keep it in here, and you know, and you know, we're the, we're the greatest thing next, next to peanut butter, amen. No, we, we believe it, beloved, that we know God is glorious, and that God wants to help us reach souls. You didn't get saved, beloved, just to occupy a seat, amen. We were saved because the living God wants to glorify his life through your life, beloved man. So I want to encourage you, do, let's do something. You're invited to do something, beloved. Maybe you might say, you know what, this is coming Saturday. I haven't gone to an outreach in a while. Take some time, beloved. Can I, can I ask you this, beloved? If Jesus went to the cross for you, can you move your side, your schedule a little bit? Come on, church. Can you move aside your schedule while I do laundry? Listen, if you waited a week, another day won't matter. The close think, the close think. Can you can you move aside your schedule just a little bit? Isn't God worth it? Well, it's my only time for family time. Can I tell you, without God, you wouldn't have a family. You say, Pastor, huh? what are you saying? That Jesus comes first. He comes first before everything. Well, the Yankees are playing. Who cares? They don't look at you like, oh, we need you. They need, you need, you know, they, they want your money. If the Mets are playing, okay, praise God. Okay, no, okay, I won't say it. You know the score. <laughs> oh, I, oh, that was messed up. Okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, just messing and messing, man. We have a Mets deliverance line later on. <laughs> Actually, if, if, if the Boston Red Sox are playing, hey, man. Mm. We need prayer after that. <laughs> but we serve a good God, beloved, a gracious and kind God. Amen. So I want to encourage you. Take some time. The reason why, why, Pastor, why would you, why, why would you challenge folks for, for outreaches? Because can I tell you something? This is why he left us here. It would be a travesty that he would leave us here and we not do what God called us to do. He says, I shall make you fishers of men. He says, by this you shall, the world shall know you are my disciples by the love you have for one another. Labors are few. Harvest feels plentiful. This is what Jesus is talking about, brother. Going out, giving of our lives for one thing, to see one life make it. That young man we pray with, I, mean, I, 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 was, I was in the area. I saw Brother David's talking to this young man on a bicycle. Just a young man. And I'm, we, we begin talking to him and just talk. He's a young man prays. What a great blessing. A young man. Can I tell you something? Thank God for youth in our church. Look around. There's some youth in our church. Aren't you glad for that? Listen, our, the youth are here. They're not on the corner selling drugs. They're not out there doing crazy things. They're not out there tagging up a wall. They're in church. Bless God. You ought to thank God for every young man and woman in church. Thank God. I thank God for every age. It's a great blessing. Thank God our church has every age spectrum. Thank God for that, brother. It's a... What a great blessing, beloved. Amen. Let's do something for our God. This morning, beloved, as our usher comes up to receive an offering, oh, excuse me, one more announcement. Uh, um, May 4th for the sign up sheet, if you're going to be going to Union uh, City, New Jersey, help out Pastor Ambrose, dear friend, him and his wife, Brenda, precious congregation. Please, if you're going to go to it, make sure you sign up quickly, beloved. We want to make sure that will happen. Amen. As our usher is going to come up, I want to bring before you a very simple truth. 
our world is going through a very interesting time. You've seen the riots, you've seen the things that are happening, but in the midst of that, beloved, God is doing something so wonderful. He's building his precious church. God has granted us momentum. We're going to this time of year with momentum to see God be glorified. Lives are going to be healed. We've been looking and asking God, God, where do you want us? What, what do you want us to do? And you, you know what's a great blessing, beloved, is that if, the, if you think of it like, well, how can this all happen? Doesn't it seem like it's the worst time? Can I tell you something, beloved? When the storms seem the heaviest, you can still hear God's voice. God's going to help us, brother. There are many folks right now going through situations where, well, Pastor, it's getting the rents are getting so high, the food bills are getting so high. But you know something, beloved? If God has to shake the world to get their attention, when he's got his attention, when he's got their attention, who's going to give them the gospel? I've heard of people saying, you know, I, I, I don't know if I'm going to stay around. It's getting so expensive. Can I tell you something? You can't run from this. There's no place that you go, oh, there life is easier. Can I tell you something? Life is easier in a storm with God. Because can I tell you something? Storms are coming. But you know what's amazing? Jesus can be right there with you in the storm. I, I, I kind of imagine like he's right there. We're just like, I'm standing close to you if you don't mind. <laughs> like, it's, it's pretty windy out there. Yeah, it is. He's a good God. He's going to watch over you, protect you, keep you in his hands of grace and mercy, and you'll learn something of God's faithfulness as we trust him. This morning, we're going to receive an offering, our tithes and offerings. Let's be faithful to our God. I was, uh, we got a chance to meet uh, Pablo and Nicole early, uh, yesterday. We're talking to them about the future, believing God for good things. We're believing God for good things here. We're believing God to raise up men and, men and women to send out the harvest field. I had some young men with me yesterday. We uh, actually Friday night to 9 to like 10 something working. Uh, did a preaching classroom. Then in the morning, I got up here. They were here at 730 as we were working on the sermon. Believing God. It was the first time I got to get work with these men. It was a great blessing, great privilege for me to be able to do that, brother. Great. Thank, I, I thank God for that. Listen, this church is raising up preachers, amen. Got to bless God for that, amen. We're going to take this gospel to literally the world, but we'll believe in God for a miracle. I tell you, invest with us in the future, brother, for all God's going to do. Be generous this morning, brother. God is a kind and faithful God. Let's take this time. Let's give God praise, brother. Brother Mike's going to bless us up. Father God, we thank you, my Christ, my God. Heavenly Father, we're so thank you for this day. We are asking for your complete blessings in this time of time and offering. Father God, as we give to you what? What is rightfully yours, God, work on each and every heart, God. Help us to give to you, God, not hold back from you, but release to you because we trust in you, God. Help us to give to you with a heart of joy, a heart of abundance. Bless the gift and the giver. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. As we give this morning, Lord, we such a faithful God. Let's sing this morning. I've got something that the world can give. I've got something that the world can We serve a good God uh, this morning. If you have your Bibles, please turn to the book of Prob uh, excuse me, book of Second Kings chapter twenty two. Second Kings chapter twenty two. Amen. 
want to share something with you as a quick disclaimer. Having been in ministry a bit of time now, you get to see things that kind of just bring you such joy, beloved, such joy to see a life transform, a life change. You get to see precious families come in, and God brings increase to their lives. You get to see hope sparked in their life, and believe God for good things. It brings you great joy. But there is the reality of there are battles in life. There are real battles. And I'm going to say something to you this morning. I want you to think about it. There are people here you fight. You've fought things in life. You've had some, uh, you, you managed to get through life. And, you know, I mean, realize that, let's, can we be honest? Anybody here remember high school was a nightmare, right? Did you enjoy high school? I mean, to me, high school was like, can I cut the whole thing? You know, I don't want to just cut one class. I want to cut the whole thing. You know? I did not like high school. You didn't fit in one group. And it's like you always get, I, I was like, I was picked on like for just the crazy things. I started doing good in school. Oh, you're a brainiac. Oh, no, okay. I started failing. Oh, you're a flunky. What is it? What, what do you fit in? I grew my long hair. What's wrong with you? You know, I, you know, I, I, it's just a nightmare. Sometimes in your neighborhoods, you fight. You know, you're the, uh, you're the, the person who gets a job, a bunch of guys hanging on the block. And, you know, what's wrong with you, you know? Are you a narco? No, I got a job old, you know? It, it's, it's, you know, let's, let's be honest. We, we, you, you go through things, there's battles. But you know what's an interesting thing to me? As you get a little older, you realize this. Some of us have a hard fight just trying to keep our heart tender before God. You fight it trying to keep, if I can say it tactfully, you fight trying not to stay angry. Sometimes it's in marriage. None of us get married to get angry. But isn't it funny if the vow says, I do, and we do? Some of us are single. And you're angry being single. It's hard for you to keep your heart tender. Some of you have been in church for a long time. But for a long time, you fought keeping your heart tender because of people. Some of us don't even realize it. This is not even my sermon. This is just, just basic observations. You've been angry, not because of what you've done, but what because someone has done to you. And it's been since your childhood. And you're now in your 30s and 40s and even 50s, and you're still angry. So see, keeping the heart tender is not easy. Anybody who tells you you can keep your heart tender, either, it's, they have no understanding of life. So this morning, I do believe God's going to help us. The sermon comes from a time of prayer. Six days ago, I began to, or six or seven days ago, I began to work on this, got some notes in prayer. And all I did was write a little line, and God began to help me. And then the brothers, uh, we got together after our class, and, and it was a great joy. And for the men that you guys were with me, I really appreciate just working with you, man. It was a great blessing. I look forward to one day you men preaching the gospel, man. I really do. Thank God for these men, man. Our, our theme is, Oh God, heal my heart. Oh God, heal my heart. And I'm going to do something rather unusual. I, I, I think I've done this maybe twice in 22 years. But I'm going to read the whole chapter of, of, of 2 Kings 22. The reason I want to read the entire chapter, excuse me, because I want you to see this, guy, this man's life and what took place. 2 Kings 22. Listen to these words. And I'm going to get the joy this morning, beloved, the great blessing. I'm going to read in the new, the King James Version. Uh, Brother Kendrick, if he can put it up, he'll put it up in the New King James Version. So I'll read for the King James. He'll, he'll have it up on the New King James Version. The Bible says these words. Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 30 and one years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Jedidiah, the daughter of Adiah of Boshkash. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, and walked in the way of David his father, and turned not, not aside to the right hand or left. This is for a moment. 
I want you to understand what the Bible is saying. The Bible is saying that this man was not like other kings. It means he walked in the ways of King David, a righteous king. In other words, this man chose to be a godly young man at eight years old. Imagine eight years old, he's made a king. So as a young man, he decides, he's a young boy actually, he decides, I want to be right. The Bible says in verse 3, And it came to pass in the 18th year of King Josiah, that the king sent Shaphan, the son of Isaiah, and the son of Meshulam, the scribe to the house of the Lord, saying, Go up to Helki the high priest, that he may sum the silver which is brought into the house of the Lord, which the keepers of the door have gathered of the people. And let them deliver to the hand of the doers of the work, and have oversight of the house of the Lord. And let them give to the doers of the work which is in the house of the Lord, to repair the breaches of the house. Unto carpenters and builders and masons, and to buy timber and hewn stone to repair the house. Howbeit there was no reckoning made with them of the money that was delivered unto the hand, because they, they dealt faith, faithfully. And Hilkiah the high priest said unto the shape and the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shapham, and he read it. And Shapham, the scribe, came to the king and brought the king word again and said, Thy servants have gathered the money that there was found in the house and delivered it to the, the hand of them that do the work and have found the, and have the oversight of the house of the Lord. And Shapham, the scribe, showed the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest have delivered me a book. And Shapham read it before the king. Listen to these words. And it came to pass when the king had heard the words of the book of the law that he rent his clothes. To bring him to speed what's happening. The house of God at this point was broken down. It, the walls had literally been torn down. A wicked king named Ahaz was so angry, such a bitter man, such an evil man, that he actually boarded up the entrance to the house of God. He said, no one's going to enter to the house of God. Interesting enough, he had a son named Hezekiah who became a godly man. Hezekiah is Josiah's great-grandfather, great-great-grandfather. I'll explain. Now the book of the law, in other words, the Bible, the word of God is now found in the church. And one of the scribes reads it to the king. He hears it and he tears his clothes. We'll go on for a moment and I'll explain this. And the king, and the king commanded Hilkiah the priest and Ahim, Ahim the son of Shapham, and Achor the son of Melchiah, and Shapham the scribe, and Isaiah the son of the king's servant, saying, Go ye inquire the Lord for me, for the people and all, and all for Judah, and for all Judah, concerning the words of this book that is found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us, because our fathers have not hearkened unto the words of this book, to do according to all that which is written concerning us, so Hilkiah the priest and Achim, well, these names are great, aren't they? <laughs> and Achim and Shapham and Isaiah went unto Hodah the prophetess, the wife of Shalem, the son of Tikva, the son of Harhas, keeper of the wardrobe. Now she dwelt in Jerusalem in the college, and they communed with her. And she said unto them, Thus is the Lord God of Israel, tell the man that sent you to me, Thus is the Lord. Behold, I will bring evil upon this place and, and upon the inhabitants thereof, even all the words of the book which the king of Judah have read, because they have forsaken me and have burned incense unto other gods, that they might provoke me to anger with all the works of the hands. Therefore my wrath shall be kindled against this place and shall not be quenched. But to the king of Judah, which sent you to inquire the Lord, thus shall she say, Thus is the Lord God of Israel, as touching the words that thou hast heard. He now receives word from heaven. Now, words are going to be spoken over this man's life. God is trying to speak to you, young men. Listen to this. He says, because, verse 19, thine heart was tender, and thou hast humbled thyself before the Lord, when thou heardest what I spoke against this place, and against the inhabitants thereof, that they should become a desolation and a curse, and has rent thy clothes, and wept before me, I also have heard thee, says the Lord, Behold, therefore, I will gather thee unto thy fathers. Thou shalt be gathered unto thy grave in peace. Thy eyes shall not see all the evil which thou shalt bring upon this place. And they brought the king word again. Let's take a moment, brother. Let's take a moment to pray. Let's ask God to help us. Father God, we thank you, God, for grace. We thank you for mercy. 
God bring understanding of your holy scriptures. God be glorified. I come against confusion, doubt. God, I'm asking God for clarity. And I pray, Father God, be exalted in this place. God, I come against every lying, tormenting spirit, God. And I thank you for the precious blood, God. Break curses this morning, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. My opener is the determining factor. The determining factor, I call it the hearing aid. According to one website, a hearing aids are small electronic devices that amplify sounds and deliver them to the ear. These devices help people with hearing loss improve hearing and speech comprehension. So notice this. You wear a hearing aid so that it amplifies a sound, but it also does something that's very important. It helps you comprehend what somebody is saying. So think about this. A person who has experienced hearing loss has difficulty in comprehending what is being said, can wear a hearing aid, and now being able to hear and understand words and speech. God in His Word is telling us He has provided man a hearing aid. It is called the human heart. Think about that. It doesn't make sense to us. But your heart truly is a determining factor on whether or not you can hear from God. Spiritually speaking, the ability to hear from God in His Holy Word depends on the condition of your heart and not your ears. Did you catch that? To be able to hear from God, it matters more the condition of your heart than the physical condition of your ears. There are people who have perfectly good hearing and yet are deaf to God. How many people can hear perfectly, yet they're deaf to God. They don't hear God, not because they don't have ears, or not because of the condition of the ears. They don't hear God because of the condition of their hearts. That is staggering. Because in our text, a young man is going to hear from God, and incredibly, God does not even speak to this man directly, if you will. He hears from God by someone reading the Word of God initially, and his response is immediate, and his response reveals the condition of his heart. My first point, the, go- the call to guard your heart. Let me begin with a very simple consideration. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, New Living Translation says, Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Now, what the Bible is not telling us is to put a shield around your heart. It literally means, spiritually, watch over, put a sentinel, like, a, like literally somebody there for security, make sure that your heart doesn't get hurt in life. You do want to protect your heart. The Bible is telling us something very powerful. We are given encouragement or admonition to watch over the state or the condition what is known now today, foods that they, they say the certain type of foods are heart healthy. You've got to keep a good watch over your heart. For there, the condition, the state of your heart will surely determine the trajectory of your life. God is saying the condition of your heart will affect how your life will end. It will affect where your life will take you. Do you realize you can't follow your heart, beloved? Can I tell you that? You hear people today, let your heart lead you. Can I tell you the most foolish advice in the world? Most foolish thing. Your heart doesn't lie. Your heart lies to you. Truth is, child, you got to think about this. If you considered that there would be one thing that would determine the outcome of your life, would you not want to ensure you find out what that one thing is and give yourself to take care of that one thing? The Bible is telling us your heart, not your income, not your intellect, not your zip code, not where you grew up, your your heart, the condition of your heart will flavor the rest of your life. That's what the Bible is telling us. See, you must watch over the condition of your heart. In simplest terms, your heart will affect the quality of your life. I would go one step further and say it will affect the quality of your marriage. It will affect the way you parent. How many know angry people raise angry kids? Ever walked into a house where there was anger? 
Come on, church. Where there's nothing but anger. You can just feel it in the air. Likewise, you ever walk into a house where there's peace? What a great blessing. And see, the Bible's granting us wisdom and insight. It says in verse 23 of the NIV version, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything flows out of it. Your heart is like a stream. The water that flows out of it can be tampered with. It can, it can be marred water, stagnant water. In other words, this should come first in our life. Do not neglect this. Do not neglect the condition of your heart. Now, I thought about this, but this is, this is one of the things that we brought up. It's an incredible irony that admittedly must make the devil laugh. Today, man will go to great lengths to protect everything except his heart. Isn't that amazing? Do you realize that we protect our idols? Our phones. Now, li li listen to this. Okay, this is how much I care about our phone. Okay, you see this floor, right? It's a little hard. Okay, look, li listen. It's a phone. Somebody goes, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Listen, it's a phone. If something happens to it, it's replaceable. It's a st to me, I, I laugh because somebody, somebody's like, Pastor, you okay? I'll pray for you, Pastor. Because you live off this. To you, if your phone gets scratched, it's like, to me, if your phone gets scratched, it still works. I'm not going around, hey, everybody, look at my new phone. I can't tithe because I'm paying for my phone. Hey, look at my new phone. I can't pay my rent this month. Hey, we don't got groceries, but I got an iPhone. Oh, well, kids say, I'm hungry. This is just a phone. And it's good for you to see that someone feels like that. Because some folks, it's, it's like, it's incredible. You feel, that's a phone. And you protect your phone, but you won't protect your heart. Your, your, phone, your phone means everything. Your heart, well, it's, uh, you know. We have ring cameras. It was, it was funny. Someone was mentioning that on the way here, and I didn't want to. I said, I didn't write it in my notes. You know, you watch your stuff. Some of us have cars. You know, you put a bumper bully, a bumper guard. You know, don't touch my baby. Don't get near it. You know. You live in the Bronx. You people might just get a little close to it. But you allow anyone just to touch your heart. Isn't that amazing? Here's the incredible irony once again. So often man is found guarding so many things except the most important thing in his life, his, 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 his heart. Matthew 15, verse 15, 18, and 19 says, Amplified, but whatever word comes out of your mouth comes from the heart, and this is what defiles and dishonors a man. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts and plans, murders, adultery, sexual immoralities. Listen to this. Thefts, false testimony, slander, verbal abuse, irreverent speech and blasphemy. He says that comes out of the heart. Here's a thought for you for a moment. The Bible's revealing something to us. Hurtful, sinful words. Don't just, oh, that, I, I, I'm sorry, I didn't really mean that. No, you meant that. You know why you meant that? Because it's in your heart. You hear people say, I'm just kidding. No, you're not kidding. Sometimes people, do, there's some folks, the only time you tell the truth is when you're kidding. It's the only time. Evil thoughts. Do you realize evil, wait, evil thoughts don't come from your mind, they come from your heart. That's what the Bible says. Evil thoughts. Anyone else ever heard of evil thoughts? I just hate that person. That's an evil thought. I wish God would have made, had not made me this way. Why are you getting mad at God for making you the way he made you? Evil thoughts, greed, lust, jealousy. You know, people today are jealous over movie stars. Well, they pass it, they got the good life. You have no understanding of that. Look, at it, they're up there on stage rapping. And, you know, they got people around them. Can I tell you, it's all paid performance. It's not real. 
He probably he gets off the stage, takes off that gold chain, that, that false gold teeth, and goes, hey, Waldo, it's time to go home, you know? <laughs> What's your name? Technology, bro. You know, he goes home. Like, come, come on, man. Get, you know. He's got all the girls around him. Yeah, he's paying them a whole lot of money, too. No money, no girls. Plus, you don't need them. <laughs> pride. How many know we get swollen pride, not because of here, but here? And some of us, we get proud of things we shouldn't be proud of. How can you be proud of your looks? Well, don't you notice, Pastor? No, I don't notice. <laughs> proud of our intellect. Proud of things that we, we don't even think about. We, we just shouldn't be thinking about. The Bible says all these things fall out of a man's heart. Murder, sexual sins, he says. It's not here. He says sexual sins begin here. Here. You know, it's hard for us to understand. What do you mean? All the wickedness that the world thinks, transgenderism and all those things that people do, and, and, and just going into, well, I'm this and I'm this and all these. It doesn't here. It's here. Thefts, lies, slanders, and gossip. Do you realize gossip's still a sin? I mean, it's, it's amazing you got to say it in church, but you know what? You shouldn't talk about people unless they're there. You know how you stop gossip? This is a freebie. Tell the person, if that other person, that person is, that you're talking about is not here, why are we talking about them? Well, I'm just concerned. Why don't you be so concerned and take it to them? Amen. Lies. How many know Christians shouldn't lie? Shouldn't lie. You should tell the truth. The truth is, if you do not guard your heart, wickedness will flow out of your life. The Bible says, Proverbs 23, for as he thinks, not in his brain, but in his heart. For us, it's hard to physically understand this, but God has said that our hearts are much more than just an organ that beats. In the Hebrew thought, it was where the Lord literally speaks to. It's the center of a man. If I wanted to know a man, I would know his heart. The admonition is, is clear. God, guard your heart as the most costly possession you, for you. Your very life depends on the condition of your heart. One man says this. It's an interesting quote. The solemn thought that every one of us has a definite moral character and that our deeds are not accidental an accidental set of outward actions, but the flow from the inner fountain needs to be driven home to our conscience. Listen to what he's saying. If you understand what he's saying, the thought that everything that we do, the moral character of who we are, the sum of who we are, is not just some accident. I didn't say, I just slipped. No, no. It came because there's a fountain, there's a well, a wellspring called a heart. And that heart, you have to be honest. That heart can be good, it can be bad. It could be joyful, sinful. It could be healthy or unhealthy. Well, see, child of God, this is why you have to guard your heart. What flows out of your heart determines the man or woman you are and the man or woman you're becoming. Amen. For in essence, when you guard your heart, you're guarding the things that God has for you. How many realize God's got a future for you? His plans and his purposes. God's got great purposes. Your destiny. You're going to guard your heart. You're saying, I am not going to allow myself to be touched in, by my heart, letting the things affect me the way they do, because God has something for me, so I'm going to guard my heart. Now, I want to forewarn you. This next section is not easy. But as I felt very strongly about this, I, I was sharing with the men, and I appreciate the input. I was sharing with the men that this is something that I, I, I really prayed about because it was, it was on my mind the way the, man, the battles are coming today as never before. Listen to these words. I call this the heart, the arena of man's greatest testing. 2 Kings 19, verse 10 to 19. Listen to these words. 2 Kings 19, verse 10 to 19 says, Thus shall he speak to Hezekiah, the king of Judah. Do not let God, in whom you trust, deceive you, saying, Jerusalem shall not be given into the, into the hand of king Assyria. Look, 
You have heard what the king of Assyria have done to all the lands by utterly destroying them. Shall you be delivered? Have the gods of the nations delivered those from whom my father have destroyed? Gozen, Haran, Rezim, and the people of Eden who were in Telassar? Where is the king of Hamath, the king of Arpan, and the city of Seraphim, and Hena and Iva? And Hezekiah received a letter from the hand of the passengers the messengers and read it and Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord then Hezekiah prayed to the Lord and said O Lord God of Israel the one who dwells between the cherubim you are God you alone and of all the kingdoms of the earth you have made heaven and earth incline your ear another translation bend your ear O Lord and hear open your eyes O Lord and see and hear the words of Shennacherib which he has sent to reproach the living God Truly, Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste the nations and their land and have cast their gods into the fire, but they were not gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore, they have destroyed them. Now, therefore, O Lord, our God, I pray, save us from his hand that all the kings of the earth may know that you are the Lord God, you alone. Here's a man who receives a letter. He receives a letter by a messenger. A wicked king named Shnikarim has sent, sent a letter by a messenger and he says, we're going to destroy your land unless you yield, unless you surrender. And, and, and they, they, they say to him, you know, read this letter because this is your end. And he reads the letter and basically what the king has said, listen, don't have confidence in your God. Look at what I've done. In other words, the devil is saying, look at my track record. I destroyed lots of lives. What makes you think you're going to make it? What makes you think your God's going to save you? How many people have had other gods and, and we've destroyed them? We're going to destroy you. So what does this man do? Listen to what the Bible says. He, his heart is broken because he's in real warfare. His real enemy is not Shanikara. His real enemy is his own heart that wants to fail. Even the amazing, there's a condition called heart failure. He's literally bringing this letter before God. He says, God, you see this. Yes, they have laid to waste the enemies. Yes, they have conquered. But their gods weren't real. You're the only true God. And he's saying, God, I need you to help me because I don't want to fail here. I want to keep my heart right in the midst of a situation. Can I tell you something, child of God? You're going to need to pray to God help you in situations when there's no answer except God. And he's bringing this letter, God, you need to help me because you see this. And he's crying out, God, help me so I don't lose heart, though I stop believing in you. Because he's posed with a great, a great weight. He, doesn't, he wants to guard his heart. He's crying out to God. Imagine what's unfolding. His heart is pressed. His concern is not only for his own safety, the safety of his people. And he knows the overwhelming fo the force. Yet he does something incredible. He goes to God in desperation. He wants God to desperately move, to help him, to keep this battle. So he's saying, God, I need first to keep my heart right, to believe in you. Have you ever gone before God being honest? God, I'm struggling. God, this is really heavy on me. He wants to hear God. And see, this is the arena where every man, woman, and child is tested. Because long before you ever sin physically, you sin in your heart. Do you realize that? It's sin is birth right there. It is in your heart that you learned, first learn to doubt God. It is in your heart that you first question God. And I want to make a statement I pray you will not soon forget. God can move upon a heart that is tender versus a heart that is hard. Think about our text, 1 Kings 22. In our text, not an easy statement. But the house of God had been in utter ruins. I've already told you there's a man named Ahaz. He's the great, great grandfather of Josiah. He's a wicked man. He had a son named Hezekiah. Hezekiah was a godly man. Now notice this. Josiah had a father named Ammon. He was an evil man. But his grandfather, his grandfather was named Manasseh. And Manasseh is a man who's singled out in the Bible as notoriously evil. So evil was this man, was that he took his own sons and offered them to foreign gods by burning them. He would throw them into a figurine that was made of steel, and they would heat the, heat, 
heat that, that thing up. It was hollowed out. It would, they put wood and they would heat it up and they would play drums so you wouldn't hear the screams. And when his hands were open and that steel would heat up, it would light up and get red. And when it was red, because the steel would get so hot, they would throw the children on there naked. They would fry the children. Thank God the suffering was so short. But they would do it. He threw his own sons, not, not son, sons in there. So he grew up, Josiah grew up with a grandfather who was brutally wicked. He grew up with a father who was wicked. Can you imagine the chaos that he grew up in? Growing up in a home where your father, where your grandfather's a wicked man and your father is wicked. Let me just speak for a moment. This man's great great grandfather had closed the church. Let this speak to you. Manasseh was an evil king, brutally evil. His son Amnon had, was an evil king. But now his grandson Josiah became a godly man. Just imagine how this young man's life must have been. Growing up with a father who's enraged and bitter and angry. Can we be honest? Many of us grew up with angry parents. It's quiet in the house of God. And you know what's amazing? Is that no fault in your own. You didn't choose what family you're going to be born in. You know, did any of us choose? I mean, you, you, didn't, you didn't get like a, like a, happy, like a menu like, hey, hey I want to be five foot seven. You know, I, I would have asked, like, can I be like two inches taller? You know, you know? <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't get that. We didn't choose where we were born. I didn't get to choose my name. No, it would have been different. Tequa or something, you know? <laughs> I'm just teasing. What's your name? Robert. Good name. Bob. Bob A. Biles, you know? <laughs> we didn't choose this. We're born into families. We would have loved to have been born in a happy family where everything was just mother, father, and this, and this, the happy life. Some of us grew up with chaos. First of all, no dad. And a mother who was trying to be both without God. So she became enraged because she was angry at the fact that there was no man, so she's trying to be a man, yet trying to be feminine. How does a woman try to be a man and yet keep her femininity? Then she raises boys. So here she's going to try to teach a young boy how to be a man. When she's struggling how not to be a man when she has boys. Or she's got girls. And part of her is like, she doesn't want to be lonely, but she doesn't want to introduce her girls to the fact that, yes, she's realized, I've got to teach my young girls how to be a woman. But she's angry. Because she's got to teach them how love works, even though she didn't do well at love. Can we be honest? You don't think that's going to upset you? It's passed down generationally. Do you realize anger is something you pass down to your children? That's why there are people who say, you're just like mom, you're just like dad, because it's truth. You, this man, his father, Manasseh, think about it. He destroyed his own kids. That means a wife saw a husband literally destroying his own kids by his influence. The people praised him as king. His own, his own kids said, you know, you know, dad. What a tragedy when a man is known out in the streets, but he's not known in the home. Oh, come on. You're the man on the block. You want to be a good man? Learn how to wash dishes. Some sisters are like, I love that pastor. He's the greatest thing. Thanks to Peter Butter. <laughs> you know, can I tell you something? I've been married for a little bit of time, and I like washing dishes. What? Best of men. Well, get some dawn in your hands. Get that brush. Let me ask you, man of God, you like to eat? I can tell. Some of you guys like to eat. 
Y la comida mucho. ¡Huepa! ¿eh? You like to eat? Wash the dish. Your mom, your mom, your mom is not your slave, and your wife is not a slave. Bless her with a clean kitchen. You know, men and other folks, we, we make ramen and we take every, every, everything out. It's like, why is it pots out? I don't know. I just like to live the look of it. You know. What I'm saying is, imagine how he must have grown up. He grew up in a very dysfunctional family, a father mad, a mother mad. And there, in their anger, they're supposed to deposit love? How does a mother show love to a child when she's angry at her husband? How does a woman feel secure in a home when she realizes, I didn't even marry that guy who gave me a kid? Come on, church. Let's be real. Do you want to build a life for your children? You realize, man, my life is not so great. And they're angry at themselves. And a woman who's angry at herself is going to have a hard time loving someone called son or daughter. And Josiah is growing up in this insanity. How he's got a process. I cannot be angry like everybody else. My whole existence since I was eight years old, probably earlier than that. Because you know what's funny? His father was a king. Men applauded him. Be careful that you don't get your props as a man by the world, not your home. The most important praise you need is from your family, man of God. Look at what anybody thinks about you. You need to know what your wife thinks about you and what your children think about you. That's good praise you. Thank you. And here it is, this man, Josiah. He has to handle anger and hatred and resentment. You don't think he understands what it is to have resentment at a father? Dad, you were an evil man. And forgiving a, someone who's been evil. Can you imagine forgiving your grandfather for killing your two uncles when they were innocent children? Can you imagine a wife forgiving a man because his influence caused the destruction of his kids? And he's got to live through this. He had to repent, get close to God, because bitterness was a constant companion in his home. He was a deep, he was a young man who came from a deeply troubled And dare I say, cursed home. Because can I tell you something, child of God? There's a point where you got to realize this is a curse. But I'm here to tell you, God breaks curses. Because just because that was how your family was, does not mean that you will have to impart that to your children. I'm a firm believer. I, 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 I'm a firm believer. Listen to this. I believe our homes could be full of joy. Now, let, let, let me just be very real with you. I don't mean plastic joy. You know what plastic joy is? Plastic joy is when you go into debt for all the little things you got to have. Your children can be happy with just you loving them. Love your kids, man. They'll be the happiest kids on the planet. And you know, you know how you know you're doing right when other kids look at your family and say, hey, can I spend time with you guys? They just want to be around you because they feel hope. They, when they see a marriage where people actually love each other. This is why I, I'm so against this, you know, oh, you know, we can't show up. I'm not saying, you know, you know, get so close. But, you know, I, I hug my wife in church. Why? Well, you, know, you should show restraint. You're a pastor. What are you talking about, knucklehead? I love my wife. Are you on crack? I love my wife. What is that? I can't hug my wife. I know you can't hug her. I hug her a lot. I like to hug her. She's very huggable. That's how kids come, you know. I know, you know. <laughs> what, what is that? Can't hug you. Oh, you kiss her, you know? You, you, you know, that makes people feel bad. Well, then don't look. Yeah? Well, you, you, PDA warning. <laughs> Come on. Got to be honest, beloved. And see, there's something powerful here. This man grew up in this, yet notice this. In all that he grew up in, the Lord said, because your heart was tender. 
So he had to fight things to keep a tender heart. That's a great temptation. God, I am not going to allow my family to make me hard-hearted. You know how many women are hard-hearted in the Bronx? I'm talking about stone cold. You're walking around with a heart that it's, 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 it's almost like ice. And then you wonder why you have a hard time loving and connecting people. Not just your children, but a spouse. You know how many men are angry at women? They're angry. And then they have a hard time connecting with their daughters. Because can I tell you something? Anger deceives you. You take out anger on the wrong people, the ones who love you. Come on, we, we say amen, it's true. And see, Josiah did something incredible. He did not allow himself the luxury of becoming enraged and bitter and hateful in life. You know, there's some people that just love to be angry. And you know why? It's, it's, a, it's a proven fact. When you're angry, it's almost like you have so much of an epinephrine rush that people love to live in the high. Yeah, you know, I'll give you this simple analogy. Anybody here, you drink coffee, and we have a fast. What happens? After about an hour, we, I say, I announce, we're going to have a fast. I, uh, I did, we didn't even start the fast. <laughs> but you're just thinking, I'm not going to have no coffee. Oh, I stinking devil. I can't, why can't we not fast, Pastor? Get it, you stinking you know. Then day two, I have to be very careful where I pray. It's a landmine on the floor. Should let me have my coffee, bro. <laughs> and then day three, after we break a fast, so the first thing you do, <sighs> thank you, Jesus. <laughs> You're not thanking God for salvation. You're thanking God for Bustelo, you know? <laughs> what happens? Your body craves coffee because it's constantly on high. The moment you deprive it, you, you, you get nervous, you get tense, you get a little bit angry. That's how some people are with anger. You're so used to being angry that when you're not angry, it angers you. I'm tired of what? I'm not being angry today. I'm starting to feel better. It's true. There are people that don't even realize how angry they are. When you get in a car, you get angry about something. Slam your own door. It's cold outside. It's warm outside. It's sunny. It's too windy. I got to go back on the LIE. <laughs> <laughs> the hunch is so, it's got to be at least three people on the road today. I'm sure I can see it, you know. Uber drivers, Lyft drivers, taxi cab, huepa, you know. <laughs> you know. Come on, church, be honest. Then if you're a wife, <laughs> slow down. I'm doing 45. And then, you know, you tell it nicely. Babe, I'm doing 45. Right? Isn't that how you talk to her? What do you mean, girl? I'm doing 45. Do you want to drive? <laughs> I know nobody here does that. <laughs> Thank God. Anyway, as you can see, this is a friendly entertainment center. Isn't it? <laughs> then your kids, I'm thirsty. No, you're not thirsty. <laughs> can we stop at McDonald's? You got money? <laughs> I, I know you never do that. Thank God you never do that. Others do that. Babe, can we get a coffee? Six dollars? <laughs> Doesn't the coffee machine at home work? Put water in, click, 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 click. Gurgle, gurgle. It's good. It's <laughs> whole less than six dollars. But isn't it true how easy? See, you have to fight. And you know what God really dealt me? You know why I'm trying to make you laugh a little bit? Because I realized how this goes in my life. It's so easy to be angry. And you know what's amazing? It's easy to be angry at people I love. How about you? I See, I'm honest. How about you? You're, you're, maybe you're the kind of person, I just love everybody. You're just always doped up, maybe. <laughs> we don't love everybody. And we get angry at people. 
And what's amazing, listen to this, beloved. He decided, I will not be this way. I will keep my heart tender. The child of God, he grew up in a dysfunctional family, but he made it. See, keeping your heart right is less about what others have done for you versus choosing what you want out of life. Here's a story. This man, I want to use this quote, and I'll give you his name. He said, the one thing you can't take away from me is the way I choose to respond to what you do to me. The last, the last of, one man's, of one's freedom is to choose one's attitude in any given circumstance. His name is Viktor Frankl. Viktor Frankl was a Holocaust survivor. He had gotten married, and nine months after he got married, listen to this, his wife, his mother, and his brother were arrested and taken to a Nazi concentration camp. So was he. He was separated from them, and he wouldn't see them for years later. When he got out of the concentration camp, he had found out that they murdered his wife, his mother, and his brother. He only had nine months of marriage with a woman that he dearly loved. He lost his mother and his brother. And he said, you, you do not have the freedom. You will not take away my freedom to choose how I'm going to respond. He became a, a great lecturer on having joy and having peace. Never forget this. In your heart, you're going to be tested. The temptation will be to embitter your life. In closing, I want to give a very simple scripture. The heart, the place that God turns to. In 1 Kings 22, we read this, beloved. Listen to these words. And Shaphan the scribe showed the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest have delivered me a book, and Shaphan read it before the Lord, before the king. And it came to pass, when the king had heard the words of the book of the law, that he rent his clothes. He is now hearing somebody read the Bible. He's not even reading himself. God's not speaking to him. Yet, God is speaking to him by the reading of the word of God. God touches his heart, and a miracle happens. We read in Acts 2.37, now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? New Living Translation says, Peter's words pierced their hearts. Amplified says, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart with remorse and anxiety. See, the word of God can do in your heart the miracle of awakening you. It can pierce you. It can make you feel, God, I'm wrong for being angry. God, I'm wrong for feeling these things in my heart. And the word of God can pierce that. That's why it's a sword. It can pierce that. Here's an absolute miracle took place. Hearing the word of God led this man, and I love this. Many of you heard it right, right in the Sunday school. It led him to repentance. He cried out. Him tearing that was saying, I don't care how anybody thinks. They've made me a king, but you know what? I'm still a slave to anger here. And he ripped off that and said, you know what? God touched my heart. And God spoke to Josiah a, a glorious promise. You shall go to the grave in peace. Now think about that. Think about that promise. You were birthed in utter chaos. You were birthed in anger. You were birthed in an angry home of bitterness, resentment, and hatred. But he says, your birth shall not be your death. That tells me that how we begin does not have to indicate how we're going to end. That with God, we could, have came, we could have come up from the worst neighborhoods, from the worst backgrounds. Our homes might have been drug-filled homes, alcoholic homes, anger, bitterness, no marriages, hate, hateful men, hateful women. But God says, no, you're going to go to the grave in peace. I'm going to bless you in my presence. I'm, but just the way you responded, because I'm going to bless you because of one thing. You worked hard to keep a tender heart. When it was easy to get mad, you chose no. God had done a miracle in you. See, it's a lot harder to keep a tender heart than to just get angry. Anybody can get angry. But it takes a lot to forgive. I want to leave it with a practical application. If you want to have a tender heart, you're going to, have to be a man or woman of prayer. If you are not a man or woman of prayer, don't, don't, say, don't even for a moment think, well, I want to I tend to heart. If you don't pray, how can God help you be tender if you're not even tender to him? You've got to learn to forgive people. Forgiving people does not mean that, oh, what was done doesn't matter. No, it happened. 
But forgiving people means, God, I'm going to leave this in your hands. Whether it's a violation, whether it's a betrayal, whether it's a horrible thing that's happened in your life, it's not saying it didn't happen. It's just saying, God, I trust you more. God, I trust you. This will not determine my life. You will. That's what, that's what forgiveness is. It's saying, God, I leave them in your hands. Do you realize we want revenge and God wants their salvation? We look at people like, you hurt me, so I'm going to hurt you. God says, you know what? Think about what you've done. You and I, we all have things that we've been wrong for, but God forgave us. We need to forgive people. Well, they betrayed me. They hurt me in my marriage. They hurt me with my children. Whatever it was. You can say, you know what? The Bible says, if at all possible, live peaceably with all men, I release you to God. I'm not going to carry that in my heart. And a tender heart, a tender heart, I know this doesn't make sense. A tender heart always remembers what's God, what God has done for you. When you're tempted to be angry at somebody, remember that you sinned. Remember that God forgave you. Have you ever prayed God forgive you for something you know that was wrong and he forgave you? You're going to have to learn to forgive people. I'll leave you with just a few, a few simple thoughts. A tender heart will always have expression. A tender heart is much more than feelings. A tender heart will move you to want to get closer to God. Let's take a moment and bow our hearts before God. I thank you for the privilege of this of ministering the word of God to you this morning, brother. I do count it a great joy, brother. There are precious souls in this church this morning that God cares for. So very much about. There are families. There are singles, teens, young men. We have the full range spectrum. What a great blessing that is, young men. Great blessing. I thank God for that. I really do. I said that's a great joy, brother. The full spectrum of that. And in the midst of that, there are people here. And if you'll be honest, you you grew up in a Josiah home. Josiah became king at eight years old, but he already had lived in bitterness, anger, and chaos and resentment. He grew up with a wicked father. His grandfather, who should have been a loving man to teach him, but so true, grandfather is the role of a grandfather. What a Incredible thought that is. There to teach, in part, the joy of life. To teach what, what miracle of having lived at that time. His grandfather Manasseh was a man notoriously evil. And to the midst of all the chaos, all the anger and the resentment, Josiah, by God's grace, kept a tender heart. Undoubtedly, it was a miracle. Undoubtedly, God had mercy on this young boy. And I believe this young boy, as a young teen growing up, he learned to pray. I believe that he thought about his great-grandfather. See, there, there's a thing called grace. If you know his lineage, Josiah had a father named Amon who was wicked. Had a grandfather named Manasseh who was notoriously evil, but he had a great grandfather. His name was Hezekiah. Hezekiah was a godly man. And who knows if Hezekiah would pray, Oh God, save my future generations. And could it be that young Josiah thought about his great grandfather? If that God who met my great-grandpa can meet me, I'll serve you. And God had mercy on this young boy. And he kept a tender heart in the midst of utter chaos, ruin, anger, bitterness. God had mercy. God's going to have mercy on folks this morning because he loves you. Some, your home 
was not the perfect home growing up. And you've done the best you can at times to try to stay away from that. But to be honest, you've allowed things in your heart. I want to be very specific with this. There are men here, you, you, you've grown up to be a bitter man. You're angry. Things have not worked out well for you. You've had struggles in relationships, struggles with children, struggles with male authority. And I tell you what, God's going to help you this morning. There's women here. You're precious in the Lord's sight. He loves you. But the reality is you haven't always had a good background. You've grown up in a home of anger, resentment, an angry mother, maybe an absent father. And you weren't treated, you weren't loved the way you should have been loved. For some, it's rejection. God's going to help you in that. God's going to help you. My first call this morning before we do anything else, you're here and you're not saved, you're not born again. I want you to know the Lord Jesus Christ loves you. He's going to help you. The Lord Jesus Christ loves you. He's going to help you. And anyone here, unsaved and back, to need Jesus, God is going to help you. Listen, God's going to give you a new start. I'm not asking you to join the church. I'm asking you to repent of sin. You realize in this morning, yes, that's me. I'm an angry person. But the greatest thing that I need help with is my sin problem. I need to repent of my sin. I need to repent and ask God to forgive me. Is that you this morning who lift up hands and say, you know what? I want to repent. I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to surrender. Will there be anyone here this morning? Yes, God sees that. We want join his honest hearts this morning. God wants to help you. It's going to begin by repentance. You, you say, you know what? I, I'm going to be right with God. I want to repent. I want to get my life together. Is there anybody here? God's dealing with your heart because he loves you. Is that you? You want to repent of sin. You want to get your heart right with the living God. Is that you? You want to repent. You lift up your hand and say, you know what? I want to pray this morning. I want God to forgive me. That, is that you this morning? Let the living God touch you. One last call. Unsave the backslide. Remember your backslide. You're away from God. You one time walk with God, but you realize this morning you're backsliding. Backslide, come on to Jesus. Let the living God speak to your life. Backslide with your spawn. And lift up hand. Let his grace touch you. Will there anyone here this morning? Unsave the backslide. Praise God. Then that one soul that lift your hands. One, a sister, help me pray, man. And I believe God for good things. Changing the order of service. <clears throat> there are believers here. You've given your life to Christ. You believe in Jesus. But if you'll be honest, God has dealt with you in a simple sermon. God has dealt with you about the nature of anger. Josiah was a man that grew up in a chaotic home. But God said, because your heart was tender. In other words, your heart is where God turns to. He doesn't turn to your mind, to your intellect. God turns to your heart. And here he met a man. He says, your heart is tender. Your heart, I can meet you there. Because you're being tender before me. You're, 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 you're fighting this through. You're saying, making a decision. I want to put aside the anger. I want to put aside my upbringing. Put aside my resentment towards my mother who wasn't really a good mother. Put aside my resentment against my father who wasn't there for me. I'm making a choice to be right. And watch what God will do. This morning, I want you to know God's going to help you as we make some transactions with God. I want to make a simple altar call. You come and let the living God speak to you. And afterwards, we're going to take a moment and pray. God's going to help you this morning. These altars are open. You come and spend time with God. Let the living God speak to your heart. Father God, we thank you, Lord God. Grace, God, mercy, God. Thank you, Lord. Yes. Majestic is your name.
I pray, Father God, I ask you, Lord God. Oh God, I pray, Father God, I thank you, Lord God. Yes, my Christ, my God, I pray, Father God. Oh God, I pray, Father God. I lift you up my hands, my God. Oh God, I pray, Father God. You give him my soul. You are holy, holy God. I pray, Father God. Yes, my Lord, my God, I pray, Father God. Your praise and my heart will cry out loud and say, You're my righteousness. You're my strength. You're my redeemer. And my lips shall sing your praise. Delivered me from darkness unto light. You've given my soul abundant life. The chest is your name. And it shall sing your praise, and my heart will cry out loud and say, You're my. do some tonight I think I want to pray asking God to bring deliverance and healing it's going to come when we forgive and know this forgiveness is never belittling what took place for some you heard horrible words growing up I didn't have to have you I wish you weren't here you're just like your father you're just like your mother. You heard horrible words. Why can't you be like? You heard horrible words. Some have even heard words like, I never wanted you. You've heard words like that. And God wants to let you know that he's a healer. He's a gracious healer. God loves you more than you'll ever know. He's going to heal the wounding of your heart. As we bow our hearts before God, we're going to have to repent. We're going to have to trust that God is going to do, he'll work it out. You, you just stay right with him. Let God be God. Let, let him deal with that. 
you lay this in God's feet and watch God's mercy. What he'll do, he'll change your life. Because you, you'll begin to be a person who actually lets people in. You stop being a cold. You'll actually make friends. Marriages can get healed. You know, marriages should be close. Not just we live together. That's not a marriage. Just living together isn't a marriage. You want to have a marriage where there's love. Just because you're all in the same house doesn't mean you're a family. A family should be close. Your kids should know that I can embrace my, my father and my mother. And they, they, they hug me because they love me. God will restore homes. This morning, let's, take, let's, moment, let's pray. We're going to ask God for help. I want you to say these words. Lord Jesus, I bring before you this pain. You saw what took place. I want you to name it silently before God. Name what took place. Name it. Don't be ashamed of it. It's between you and God. I'm not asking you to be loud. Name it. Say, tell God what took place. I want you to say this. Lord, I brought this before you. I'm not hiding it. It's no longer going to have dominion over me. I'm going to trust in you as I repent of harboring anger, resentment, and bitterness. I'm going to walk free in your grace, in your love. You're going to heal my heart. You're going to heal my home. You're going to heal my family. And God, I'm grateful that you love me. In Jesus' name I pray. Let's take a moment. Let's give God praise this morning. Father, we thank you, Lord God. Grace, God, mercy, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, for the blood, my Jesus, my God. We thank you, Lord God. Holy One, God, I pray, Father God. Thank you, Lord God. Yes, my God. not leave this place that you have came in with those wounds and hurts, but leave them at the altar, says the Lord your God. For I have brought healing to your heart, and I'm causing you to be a vessel, that you will no longer respond like you used to, speaking words of hurt and pain, not just the pain that reflected upon you, but those words that you speak will, will brought pain and hurt to others. And I know what they've done to you, but I'm the Lord your God, and I brought a healing in your life, and I want you, my people, my God, to walk into purpose, to walk into destiny, because when I commanded my servant Moses to speak to the rock, what did he did? He struck out the rock, and he did not hollow me in the eyes of the people. They looked at Moses, but they looked to me as a God that's full of anger and rage, but I'm a God that's merciful and gracious. Do not respond like you used to, but allow my word to run through you and speak my word, for my word will bring refreshing upon your family members. It will bring refreshing upon your parents, even your sons and daughters. It will bring healing. Just speak my word and do not respond like you used to. Thus says the Lord your God. Let's give God praise this morning. Father God, thank you, Lord God. I lift you up, my Jesus, my God. I pray, Father God, I thank you, Lord God. We serve a good God, brother. You'll know God's doing a miracle, brother. And some for some, the miracle it'll be so it'll be so incredible. You know, you know, you can have an argument and not have to curse. You know that you can have an argument with your spouse and not have to be angry at them? You know, arguments, disagreements, that's part of life. You know, so it doesn't mean you have to stay bitter. And you know what's amazing? When God begins to heal homes like this, you can actually realize that you can put your cell phone down and actually talk. You know what a blessing is? You can talk to a child, talk to your spouse. You can sit down and have a meal together. If someone asks you a question, it's not you respond like, you know, like you're ready to hit. You respond like, you just talk. You can smile more. 
intent in marriages. This is a freely your marriage can flourish. You know, marriages, as we see it, marriages are not about just a, well, this season. Marriage is about the long haul. Seasons come and go. But you want the long haul. That way family can see the joy and, and God will help us and he'll give you peace as he, he causes your heart to become tender. It's a great blessing, brothers. Once again, appreciate folks. You, you know, you, some of the folks who consistently bring stuff on Sunday morning, thank God. You know, we just want to say a moment, just say thank you. That's a great blessing. You take time for that. Amen. Amen. You, it, you really are a great blessing. You make a, a great sense of joy for the church. Amen. And I tell you what, those that come, we really appreciate you being here this morning. Great blessing. Speak the word of God. Those watching the live stream, what a great joy, brothers. All God's doing. Look at what God is doing in our church. What a great blessing, brothers. Amen. Rejoice. Maybe you're new to the church, brothers. Find your place of service. Find your place of, of just, you know, find yourself in the house of God, knowing that God cares about you, brothers. Amen. As we bow our hearts before the living God and going, knowing that our God has been good to us. As we do, beloved, we're going to have uh, Brother Felipe close us in a word of prayer this morning. Father God, we thank you, Lord God, for all that you've done in our hearts today, Lord God. Continue to speak to our hearts, Lord God. Help us, God, to let things go, Lord God, and leave it at the altar, Lord God. God, I pray, Lord God, that you're here with us today, Lord God, and we would leave with you in our hearts, Lord God. Continue to tenderize our hearts, Lord God, and God.